So why do compounds and molecules form? Well, all of our atoms have something called valence electrons. Those are the electrons in the outermost shell or the outermost orbital of the atom. And they can easily be figured out by the group number of the element. So if it is in column number one, it has one valence electron. If it is in column number two, it has two valence electrons. If we go over to the other side of the periodic table, and it is in column 18, it has eight valence electrons. If it's in column 17, or sometimes labeled column seven, it has seven valence electrons. All of our atoms want to have a full outer shell of electrons. Typically, this is eight electrons. So in order to get that full outer shell, it wants to either gain or lose electrons or share them in order to fill it. So if we look at our Bohr model here, we have the nucleus, we have six valence electrons in the outermost shell. Which element would this be? Well, this would be oxygen because it has six electrons in the outermost shell. The two in this inner shell or the inner orbital come from the first row on the periodic table. The six in the outer ring come from the second row of the periodic table. So in this wants to gain two electrons in order to have an octet in that outer shell. So because it has six, it wants to gain two electrons. And the way that it does this is it either shares or it steals electrons. And depending on if it shares, that would be a covalent bond. If it steals, it would be an ionic bond. So let's complete the following table. Based on the column on the periodic table, decide the number of valence electrons and the number it needs to get a full octet. So for sulfur, it is in column 16. Sometimes on periodic table, it's labeled column six. It is going to have six valence electrons. In order to get a full octet, remember octet means eight, it needs to get two more electrons. See if you can complete the rest of the table. Pause the video. Nitrogen, because it's in column 15 or column five, it has five valence electrons. It wants needs three more to get to the full octet. Chlorine is in column 17 or seven, so it has seven valence electrons. It needs to gain one. Potassium is in column one, and so it needs to gain seven or lose one electron in order to get to the full octet. Which do you think would be easier, gaining seven or losing one? We're going to find out that losing one is easier. Some molecules, in order to form our octets, form something called diatomic molecules. It's two atoms of the same element that bond together to share their electrons to complete the octet. The diatomic molecules are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. You can remember these by the rule of seven. We start at number seven on the periodic table, which is nitrogen. We go over to column seven or column 17, and we make the shape of a seven. There is always one exception to any good rule, and our exception here is hydrogen. Hydrogen is also a diatomic molecule. The reason for this is because 
if we look at our valence electrons, for example, fluorine has seven. If it combines with another fluorine, which has seven, by sharing these two electrons, it counts towards each of the fluorine, and then each fluorine would have eight. So it makes a chemical bond by sharing, and the electrons count towards each atom. They're able to achieve the full octet. We can achieve our octet. We just saw how by sharing electrons, we can achieve our octet. So we can form covalent bonds through sharing. And this is going to be focused on in chapter seven. We can also steal electrons. So we can share to form covalent bonds. We can steal to form ionic bonds or ions. So the atoms actually transfer electrons in order to get to their octet. If it's a metal, it's going to give up its electron. If it's a non-metal, it's going to gain the electron, and then they're each going to have a charge and be called ions. Those charged particles are going to be attracted to each other and form between ions of opposite charge are called ionic bonds. And this we will be looking more at in chapter six. How do we know if it's going to form a covalent bond or an ionic bond? Well, covalent bonds form between two nonmetals. And we call these things, call these resulting compounds and molecules covalent compounds or covalent molecules. If it's an ionic bond that forms, this happens between a metal and a non-metal ion, and the resulting compounds are ionic compounds. We do not refer to them as molecules. Well, how do we know if it's a metal or a non-metal? Our periodic table is split up into the left side and the upper right side. There's a stair step that happens between our metals and our non-metals. If it is on the left side, everything that is outlined in red, it is a metal. If it is on the right side, outlined in blue, it is a non-metal. Hydrogen can act as a metal. Sometimes if it is paired with group seven, we consider it a metal. When it's paired with any other atom, we consider it a non-metal. So hydrogen can behave as both. Most of the time, we consider it a non-metal. Again, unless it is paired with group seven or column 17 on the periodic table. Determine if the following compounds are ionic or covalent. Pause the video and try to classify these. If we look at our first example, pH3, so phosphorus is a nonmetal. It is not in group seven. So phosphorus with hydrogen, hydrogen would behave as a nonmetal in this case, and this would be a covalent compound. If we look at KBr, Potassium is in the first column of the periodic table. It is a metal. Bromine is in group seven. It is a non-metal. And so we have a metal and a non-metal. This would be an ionic compound. Barium is in group two of the periodic table, a metal. Chlorine is in group seven or a non-metal. So this would be ionic. Anytime we have a metal with a non-metal, it's an ionic compound. 
Nitrogen is a nonmetal. Oxygen is a nonmetal. Both are nonmetals. So this would be covalent. Copper is a transition metal in the shorter columns of the periodic table. Chloride is, or chlorine, is in columns seven, group seven. So this is a metal and a nonmetal. It would be ionic. Fluorine is in group seven. It is attached to a hydrogen because it is a Non-metal in, in group 7 attached to hydrogen, this is going to act like an ionic compound. Hydrogen in this case is going to behave more like a metal. We have sodium, which is a metal. We have oxygen and hydrogen. So between the oxygen and hydrogen, we have a covalent bond because it is a non-metal and a non-metal. Hydrogen in this case is behaving as a non-metal because it is not attached to a halogen or which is group 7. So between the oxygen and the hydrogen we have a covalent bond. Between the metal and the OH there is an ionic bond because it's a metal with non-metals. Selenium is in column six or group six, which is a nonmetal. Chloride is in group seven, which is a nonmetal. So this would be a covalent compound. Nonmetals attached to nonmetals are covalent. Metals attached to nonmetals are ionic. Hopefully, in this chapter, you have learned more about the classifications of matter and how we represent molecules and compounds using chemical formulas. Can identify pure substance from a mixture and learn more about the layers of the Earth's atmosphere. We found out what a full octet is and why, why atoms have varying numbers of valence electrons in order to determine what type of bond that atom is going to form. And the differences between covalent and ionic bonds that are formed in order to complete the octet.